Does this rear sight go out to 2,000 meters? It wasn't uh, meters. Yeah. It's, a, is, it's a Russian unit of measurement that mm-hmm. I can't recall what it is. Of course they have their own. Yeah. Why but wouldn't they have their own? It's not meters. And it I goes just, out to 20. I should have studied up on that. This isn't, but judging by how much it's cantilevering up this rear sight, I wouldn't doubt it if it's somewhere near 2,000 meters. I think it's, it's probably further. I mean, it's, I mean so this, is, this is seriously looks like something you'd see in a grenade launcher. Yeah, I don't. Mm-hmm. I'm not even halfway yet. What's up, everybody? Welcome to uh, another awesome listener special. We get to do these on occasion where uh, somebody who tunes into the podcast a fair amount comes on in, and they're on the podcast, actually. So across the table from Mark and myself is Will Elliott here and uh, Ryan Muckenhern as well. And uh, Ryan shows up to be our go-to encyclopedia for a lot of things, cartridges and gun history. Uh, Will himself knows a fair amount about firearm history and whatnot. He's an enthusiast. Uh, he was just he was just explained to us though that uh, you know don't expect him to be Mr. Historian over there. Although I do think you might be a bit, a bit of a sleeper on us here. But just in case we do have uh, we do have Ryan and um, everything Ryan says is right. So that's true. Yeah, hmm. that's a true statement. Yeah, that's my it. father will never least, listen to this podcast. <laughs> at least at <laughs> least you say it in a confident enough manner. It's that all I, about I the cell. Question mm-hmm. it. It's right. all about the cell. So, um, Will, you reached out because we've done some cartridge podcasts. You know, we do a lot of those 10, well, they're not really 10 anymore, but anyway, they're 10, 10 minute talks, um, on various different cartridges and one that we haven't done yet. We've actually seen a couple of requests for it from some other people, um, yourself included, and you happen to have some really sweet rifles chambered in it is the 762 by 54 R. Yep. Very recently I learned R doesn't stand for Russian, which I thought it did. It, it might, might as well. As, it might as well. <laughs> yeah. Was that disappointing to you, Jim? Actually, yeah. <laughs> you know what's <laughs> funny though is they call it the seven six two Russian, right? So is that like, is that like the three oh three British? Is there a cartridge that's called like? Why don't they call it the thirty out six American? Well, they had the thirty U.S. And then they had the thirty U.S. government. Do they have the thirty American? No, I think that's the thirty thirty. No, that's Not a good the 30 point. Outs- Patent pending. Pat- say it. Say it. Patent pending. Okay, got it. Okay, got that. Yep. Um, well, I don't think you can just say. That's how it works. It's I've, like dibs. Yeah. All right. Um, We're calling shotgun. I'm sure. Yeah. That's Le- right. Legal. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Do you know the rules of shotgun? Um, <laughs> all right. So, Will, before we dive in on uh, the cartridge itself and these awesome guns that you've brought along, uh, how about a quick intro though for those listening out there? Okay. So, my name is William Elliott. Uh, gun enthusiast. Uh, ever since I was about 25, um, what I wanted to do was I wanted to actually start a gun collection of World War II rifles. There's this something about the history, uh, the patina, um, the the sheer smell of it. Yep. It takes you back um, to when machining and groundbreaking things were happening for different types of rifles. With this uh, Mazen. Mosin, sorry. It went through so many different changes just to. Uh, <laughs> Ryan's putting it for those not yeah, watching. Of, of grease and oil yeah. right now. Will made a really good point. The smell is the smell is it's amazing. A thing. It's it a is. Thing. It is. It's an aphrodisiac yep. for gun enthusiasts. Might as well be gasoline on a rag. Right. <laughs> just the the how they've been treated over the years. The the chips, the marks. Every little mark has a, it, it's a history thing. Mm-hmm. That well, I wonder what happened when this mark was made on this rifle. You know, it makes you think, and it makes you wonder who carried this rifle. Did this rifle save somebody's life? Did this rifle, you know, win the war for somebody in a battle? You know, it's just the history is well, is I'm amazing getting, about these things. I'm getting, getting chills. Bumps? I am, <laughs> Are they man. Up, Mark? Like, I, I I hadn't really been thinking about them that. I mean, they're super cool to look at, and there's a ton of history. But man, when you start getting into just you know, yeah. wondering the life of that rifle and the person who held it, man. Mm-hmm. That's some that, heavy stuff. That's the stuff that makes me want to buy old World War II rifles is is that history part about it. Mm-hmm. And so what I did is I remember that we were just chatting about memories, Mr. Muckiner here and his infinite wisdom and memory. Elephant memory. Yes. Um, my story about that first rifle, which is the Mosin Nagant 9130, 
My dad and I went to our very first gun show together because I wanted to start a collection, and he knew a little bit more about it in my 25, at the age of 25, than I knew anything about guns. So he was, he was my, you know, helper, if you will, and we went to Orfordville, the Legion, first gun show ever, nice and small, very intimate, walked around and talked to a bunch of people, you know, learned a little bit, because I was still learning. Walked by this one gentleman selling that Mosin right there and 85 bucks. I said, Dad, what do you think? Heck of a deal. It's a heck of a deal and it's a piece of history. And I will never sell that. Because That's cool. I bought yeah. it with my dad. Oh, totally. You know, and it's a piece of history. Um, I brought some extra parts with it because it's kind of hard to carry that in a case when you have the. The poker oh, yeah. on there. <laughs> the old uh, kebab maker. Yes. It, it, and it also duels um, as a tool. I was going to yeah. say, it looks if like a take, screwdriver. If on you the like a flathead you can use it as a tool also. Yeah. Which I didn't read too much up about the uh, old bayonets on them, but I know one thing that the, in the military that they wanted is, why you see in all the history pictures, there's always a bayonet on the rifle. Okay. Was because of Blitzkrieg. Oh, sure. Mm-hmm. Because, yep. you know, it's a bolt-action five-round rifle. It's made very hardy. Um, tolerances are a little loose, kind of like the AK, so it runs, okay? It's sure. not tight tolerances. You drop it, you can pick it up, you can still shoot it. Um, the soldiers were re- requesting a pokey stick, good terminology for it, and a long one because of Blitzkrieg. They'd get a- attacked, and it'd be a rush, they run out of battery or couldn't reload fast enough. So you can't stick the German guy with your front end of your barrel. You're not going to do any damage. So that's why one of the things is in the history, you see all the time that is on that barrel for protection. Makes perfect sense. I love I love seeing these Mosins here because, uh, to your point from going to that gun show back in the day, I mean, I can remember a time not long ago at all because I got into my gun buying frenzy when I was 18, literally like turned 18, parents are gone for a week, bought a lot of guns. <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> so I remember walking into the store and uh, seeing just a barrel of Mosins. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it was just Mosins... Everywhere. I mean, they they basically almost w- I, I wanted mean, you to take they them. They treat like, them like garbage. Please get rid of these things. And yeah, you could find them for 70, 80 bucks. That wasn't uncommon at all. Ryan, you were explaining how they used to show up at your gun shop back in the day. I yeah. mean, just a box of Mosins it was, packed uh, in Cosmoline and straw. It was when you were looking to bump the order over to get free freight. <laughs> He's like, wow, we got enough Remington 870s and Model 700s. And here's this crate of Mosin, literally a crate, a uh, wooden crate uh, of Mosins. I think 10 in a, in a crate. And you would order them and, and that would get you over freight. Right? And then you'd have a crate of Mosins to contend with. How? It, and you had to clean them all out. Oh, course, they came out. Packed. Yeah. So, I mean, after, I guess, effectively World War II, the war machine and war effort in Russia had. So many of these rifles produced. I, I mean, I think the theory was every man, woman, and child, uh, they had all these rifles, and they're like, well, we're going to save these for a rainy day. Uh, and they packed them in, in uh, Cosmoline, which if you're a, a firearms history person, you know the smell, you know the feel, you might mm-hmm. even know the taste. Um, <laughs> yeah. and Unfortunately. Yeah. I liked it. And... Uh, <laughs> They, uh, yeah, they put them in away or put them away for indefinite storage, and and as the world modernized and conflict became less of a, a mainstay, these things, if, you know, eventually came out of storage and were sold on the open market through various importers. And um, sometimes you get some rare gems. Sometimes you'd get, you know, a battle rifle that had been beat up uh, through yeah. Stalingrad. And why is it that now all of a sudden they're like four or five hundred bucks? You know, I. Did they just? Did we finally dry up the Russian supply, or is it I, all the politics involved I think with Russia? And- I think it's a lot of that. I think that um, a whole culture of folks that grew up playing these various video games that these rifles were found in commonly um, had an appreciation of them, and I think we see that with 
a lot of the modern rifles that are purchased, like mm-hmm. Scars or Mark 18s or, or things like that. Um, there's a there's this cool subculture of Millsurp that's come out, and I honestly think that it's it's younger folks, our generation, maybe a little bit older, that uh, that got on board with the with that and started buying a bunch of these things. Um, I don't know that we've diminished the world supply of these because we're still getting M1 Garands in from various European and Pacific com- or countries uh, from storage, and there were way fewer Garands made than there were Mosins. Hmm. Uh, so I think there's a little bit of a uh, demand thing that's drawing this up, but they, they used to go like between $70 and $100 was a going rate for a Mosin in you know, reputable condition. Sounds about right. Now you go to a shop and you find them in lesser condition than any of these three examples, and they're 350 to 400 bucks. So now they're selling for what like a German Mauser mm-hmm. bring back with mismatched numbers would sell for, and which is still still a Mosin, which they're really cool guns. But to your point, Russia used to make them, they were mass produced back in the day, and they were mass produced to get beat up a lot. Yep. So you're not necessarily going to get, you know, some people go in and get the K98 and you see that and you're like, my gosh, it's like a Swiss watch. Yeah. Yes. When you get a Mosin, you're like, yeah, it's kind of, it's a Russian. It's a Mosin. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. it's a yeah. Mosin. There's something very, like, uh, the, the utilitarian aspect of it is, I think, really phenomenal. I, mm-hmm. I regret every time I see them, I told myself, I'm going to buy, like, five and then I'm going to, I'm going to keep them in Cosmoline, I'm going to put them in food saver bags and, like, suck the air out of them and, like, bury them in the crawl space. Just for a rainy day. I don't see why uh, not. And I didn't, and I'm a fool. Yeah. So, um, Will, one thing, obviously, that you brought up when you brought these in is you said, you know, let's talk about the 762 by 54 r mm-hmm. So maybe, you know, that is the uh, that is the projectile that goes into each one of these three guns. I'm glad, for those of you listening who haven't even seen these yet, um, we have the one that you were talking about earlier, which is uh, kind of the classic Mosin that I've seen a lot, sort of just yes. a longer, uh, a longer Mosin rifle. Uh, you got a shorter one here with like a mm-hmm. fold up bayonet thing yep. and the sniper. The sniper. And a, yes. a legit sniper. It's a legit sniper because some people would take this regular infantry rifle, mm-hmm. modify it themselves, and then buy the scope mount and the sc- scope and then bend because it's a straight bolt on this one. That oh, one has to be bent because it's right scope. over the action. Yeah. Right? So. They'll bend it, and then it doesn't look very good. You, that ain't you can a real t- one. You can tell it's not real because it's been gunsmithed. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the 7.62 by 54R that goes in each one of these. So so 7.62, we know we're talking about basically the same pill, right, that's coming out of your 308 and 30-06? Slightly Is that? Slightly larger diameter, but nominally the same. Why would they do that? It's Russia. Okay. Yeah. So, so you then, couldn't you you can't just go to your Hornady catalog or whatever and pull out whatever seven six two bolt they have and reload up some seven six two four R with it. You could take a thirty like a common American thirty caliber bullet and load it in it. What'll probably happen, depending on the condition of the bore, is the bullet to quote Luke Horak will not obturate enough yes. to fill the uh grooves in the rifling hmm. and you may not get good seal or spin. Hmm. You can still do it. And some what's bores, like, which like Russia's Hornady do they make? Uh, be like Wolf. Okay. Yeah. So the board diameter would be 311, 312. Hmm. Um, and so slightly larger than 308 as we're accustomed to. Um, the the inverse is not true. You wouldn't take a 762, like a 311 or a 312 diameter bullet and put it in a 308 Winchester because then we would have a huge pressure spike. The good news is for the folks that um, have these rifles, and especially the snipers, like there's a, this is a, a very uh, fascinating rifle in that if you go to various parts of the world um, where we operate and occupy, you'll find this gun in use today. Mm-hmm. Like hmm. still being, like this is a quote, commonly found sniper rifle. Um, if you had one and you really wanted to, uh, eke the most accuracy out of it. A lot of the major bullet manufacturers make that bullet diameter even in a match grade projectile. Oh, wow. So, what? yep. And you can buy brass from Lapua. You can buy brass from Hornady. Um, I don't think Winchester loads 7.62 by 5.4R anymore, uh, but you could at one time get their brass. Uh, so, you, like, a hand loader is not left in, you're not stuck with burden primed corrosive ammunition necessarily. Um, you know, you can you can certainly go get 
modern components and reload it and get a lot out of out of these rifles. I can't make. The, I can't believe they make Lapua brass for it. Yeah, it's well. Mm-hmm. So it's vintage sniper matches, and it's actually oh, it's, it's an okay. exceptional sporting cartridge. And so a lot. Oh, of, it seems like it would be. It is. It is. A lot of folks are like, eh, it's so anemic and old. It's a 308 Winchester slash 30 out six slash eight Mauser. They fall so close to each other. Um, it's kind of funny. Uh, but the vintage sniper matches are still very much alive and well. Uh, and our counterparts in Europe um, still, you know, utilize those to this day. And um, finding finding those components is not difficult. I mm-hmm. guess they're still produced. Um, Hornady, I remember this one fondly had a line, I don't know that they still do, um, at least as expanded as it is or was at one time, called Vintage Match. And their uh, ballistician wizard over there, Dave Emery, had a, a write-up um, for the 762 by 54 r component of the Vintage Match line using this same rifle, fired the best group at 1,000 yards over like a 1903A4 uh, Mauser sniper, uh, and then they had this in, in uh, contention as well. And it's fighting words. Yeah, no doubt. And so the rifle's capabilities, the cartridge's capabilities, when paired properly, are phenomenal. Wow. Yes. So what, uh, as far as, I actually can't picture one right now in my head, to be honest with you. What does it look like in comparison to the 30-06? What, like, what, the design, what's yeah. special about it? Is it really efficient? Is it kind of like, well, it's not that efficient. It's kind of old, but a what's f- the deal with it? A few notables about it and why I think it's an important cartridge and an important arm in general. It's the oldest military cartridge still in current use. Yep. Um, I got that on my notes. <laughs> yeah. So, and That's it's, a good note. And, it's, yeah. and it's old, old, old. Mm-hmm. Like, it predates American uh, bottlenecking and... and uh, you know, smokeless powder by a margin. Oh yeah, we brought that up in the line, yeah. in uh, one of our previous podcasts. Yep. Is it like? It's like eighteen, um, eighteen eighty, eighteen ninety is when it was developed yeah. somewhere in there. And they actually made a round nose version. And the gentleman's name who uh, developed it, I cannot pronounce because it's in Russian. I have it written down right here. Vladimir. It's N I C H A. Maybe. G I N, I, that's, um, my Russian's not very good, <laughs> but I tried to do a little bit of research to actually get some names and some dates for some of you know, okay. you know, like to figure out what year this round was actually developed. Yeah. So it was about the eighteen eighties. Yeah, late eighteen eighties. Eighties is yeah. when it was developed. Yeah. Was that when these and guys it was, were developed? It, yeah, it was mm-hmm. developed specifically for these. So Sergei Mosin. Um, started developing these rifles back in the 1880s. He actually developed one that was tube-fed through the buttstock. That's cool. Cool, but dangerous. Because they had the round nose or pointy nose Mm -hmm. and had an out-of-battery detonation in the buttstock when they were cycling it. Right right next to your jaw. Right 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 next to your face. Yeah. So they had to change that design. Right, in the and, old brain pail. Yeah, there's tons of different uh, changes in the bolt, even that it'd take me an hour just to list all the changes until they came up with, in 1891, the design you see sitting here today. Hmm. Um, the thing with the changing of the feeding tube, uh, Mr. Nagant, his name is Leon, L-E-O-N, He's the one that designed and did the magazine on there. Okay. So you could drop in your five rounds. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that's why you get the name Mosin Nagant. It's produced by two people. A collab. A collab, yes. And the problem is the government, because it was Russia, there's been some, you know, suing or legality things yep. happened because yep. they kind of, you know, messed over Mr. Nagant. Because they didn't want to pay them so much, or like like they did a one lump sum, mm. and then after that they didn't pay him anything else, so he kind of got the short end of the stick out of the whole deal. Yeah. Um, I mean, then, he basically saved people from getting their faces blown off. Well, you'd think he'd get you know he he would get a caveat for that, saying, "Hey, you know, we got rid of that tube fed. We're going to save a lot of soldiers' lives." You know. Yeah. Totally different. Uh, the same thing happened to Mikhail Kalashnikov too. 
Um, you know, he's a watchmaker and a tank. I think he's a tank repairman or something like that and, and uh, helped put together the AK. And I think Mikhail Kalashnikov retired and died in a one-bedroom apartment in Russia. Mm-hmm. And he's a father of 500 million rifles. Um, and, uh, yeah, same thing. I think the state just kind of looked at it. was like, well, thank you for your service. <laughs> <Yeah>. You know, <laughs> like... We'll need these later. The motherland yeah. appreciates yeah. what yes. you've done. Mm-hmm. It's because he didn't say, uh, he didn't say patent. Ah, That's right. Oh, patent. If you say patent pending, you're in the clear. Right. I don't think that works in a communist country, though. No. Shoot. Unfortunately. I mean, if you just say it in Russian or you say, I don't know. Yeah. Back on the cartridge, a uh, few notables. Um, obviously, the Mosin from 1891 forward remained a mainstay of the the Russian and actually some other uh, uh, countries for battle rifle until really the advent of the the what we'll call the modern um, semi-automatic system. Um, you know, the Finns had them. I think there was even some Swiss-made Mosins, um, of course, the Russians, and then a, a couple other Eastern companies, sure. or Eastern countries, excuse me, uh, Eastern European countries had, had kind of put their spin on them. But the cartridge, uh, if you were to pick up a PKM or an RPK, uh, or various medium weight machine guns, um, chambered in 7.62 by 5.4R. Uh, here, a Maxim made a machine gun in 7.62 by 5.4R. Winchester made an 1895 in 7.62 by 5.4R for the Russians, specifically for cavalry. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, and what? How about yeah. that? Yeah. So you want that. to talk about a sweetheart? You that find little, that little section of Winchester's history they don't like to talk about. I don't know what the deal is. I think because back then you're like, well, the Russians were kind of. Yeah. What so, year are we talking? Uh, Winchester's was the model 1895. It was post 1895 that this had occurred, but they made a, a, a it's a lever gun. I mean, same thing as that. You know, Jim and I have a 405. Okay. Uh, in 7.62 by 5.4R, and um, it still to this day they, I mean. Very, very popular cartridge encountered in the Middle East, especially because uh, that part of the world is big on on these kind of arms and, and ammunition. Um, the Dragonov sniper rifle, mm-hmm. uh, the SVD, the Tiger, uh, 7.62 by 5.4R. Um, mm-hmm. and, and on the commercial side of things, uh, phenomenal sporting round. A uh, lot of Russian hunting rifles are chambered in 7.62 by 5.4R. Um, Why the, wouldn't they be? Right. The um, uh, Malat Vepers. It's common chambering. There was even some fine double rifles and single shot stocking rifles chambered mm. up in 7.62 by 5.4R. That sounds pretty handy. Yeah. Good round. Good cartridge. Good performance. Um, you asked how it looks compared to, say, an OT6 or 308. So case length is very similar to the 308. So we go back on those 10 uh, minute talks where we talk about the NATO cartridges and what the, um, like the numerical designators mean yeah so 762 of course denotes the bore diameter 54 54 denotes the case length in millimeters as measured from the head to the mouth um so a 308 is 51 uh this is 54 they're about the same size or length the What's neck 30 at six 63 okay the neck is slightly longer on the 762 by 54r um, the shoulder uh has a different angle and then it's got a little more body taper uh, most notable is the prominent rim um, which we were talking about this beforehand. Uh, the R in 7.62 by 5.4R does not stand for Russian, although it might as well, because it's often referred to as a 7.62 Russian. Uh, it stands for rimmed. Um, mm-hmm. And this was advantageous. Uh, Will brought a stripper clip here. Um, feeds through there. You can hold all your cartridges on this clip. This goes in your bandolier or your ammunition pouch. You hold a whole bunch of them. You reach in, you grab them, whoosh, stuff five into the gun and go. Clip falls away. Uh, yeah, it's a great cartridge. It's it's antiquated, I guess, um, in terms of modern cartridges. This is not to take away from its performance. Uh, it's a fine round. It does make me regret further not getting it. Oh, yeah. I have, so every day I think about, like, things I should have bought in a Mosin. Mosin. Honestly, goodness, is on the front page. Mm-hmm. So, obviously, many different Mosins were made. And uh, probably a dumb question. They're not still making them, right? I mean, at this point in time, they're st- when they're still being used, they're using old ones, right? Uh, they stopped in 65 making them. Okay. I believe it was. That's, a, that's not that long so ago. so many, no. yeah. though, that they're yeah. still being used now. Yeah. That's not that long ago, when you think about it. Yeah, the thing is, though, is like I always feel like my, my mind's time like clock stopped 
carrying on in 2000. So every time I hear 1965, I think to myself, well, that was only 35 years ago. Well, we're in right. 2020. So yeah. that is, that's a while. Mm-hmm. Man, when you say that, it's kind of, yeah, why is that? Why do we stop thinking? At I don't know. It's just like once we hit, t- it's why, that's why 2K. Okay. The, it, the, the computers themselves did, weren't the things that short circuit. It's our brains. Right. Mm-hmm. But you don't true. even know what year we're in anymore. Yeah, when you think about when you think about that, that this rifle started in 1891 and continued five years ago is when they stopped. Yeah, yeah. That's and people still use them, like you said. But they made many different variants yep. over that time period. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, like we see on the table here, and I kind of described what we have in front of us. Um, is this does this kind of make up all the variants, or I'm I'm assuming there might be a few that are maybe are more rare and not on the table. One more. So this is an M44. Which one's that now? The, the shorter, the, the shorter sh- version. So the reason I call it like a carbine. Almost it, it is, is the carbine. Yes. Okay. The reason why they made it th- was for the non-combatants. So if you're uh, oh, the whole ar- oh, okay artillery, yeah. yeah, or you know if you're working at the desk or something because of blitzkrieg, they still needed something. Mm. So th- they made the 39 M39 first. But they made it with no bare bayonet. Okay. Is that this guy right here, the long one? Nope. They, nope. I don't have an M39. It's, oh, okay. It's identical to this. Oh, okay. Got it. Just but no bayonet. They just called it the M39 with no bayonet. And mm. they made it that this bayonet that would go on the 9130 would not fit. Okay. So when they were done with that, then they were requesting, obviously, the bayonet. So the carbine started off in 1939 was their beginning of production they ended in 1945 so they discontinued making the 39 and then you get the m44 and the only change on it is the fixed bayonet on there you cannot remove it unless you're can't remove it but it folds yeah it folds which is nice I so see. there's you know, it's a folding bayonet that you, yep, just go ahead and pull, and then you lift up a little, and it locks oh, wow. into place. Look at that. It's kind of under like a spring lock kind of thing. So mm-hmm. if you're running the copy machine, that's the one you got then? Yes, okay. exactly. <laughs> I kind of like this one. I would want to have that's this one. That's the one I want, it's too. It's handy. So now that one She's is safe, everybody. really fun to shoot because the, the fireball that comes out of the end of that thing is like your uh, SBR. The fireball is literally like this big around and this long. That thing will kick like a mule. And actually, if Great. it's in the fall and you are shooting, it will physically move the, f- the leaves in front of you that are about five or six yards in front of you. <laughs> I've seen it happen. That's a gem special. You, you've you got the fireball enhancer on the your... The fireball. Uh... That's the fireball <laughs> shooter right what? there. That what? thing's just amazing. What length barrel is that then? Is that like... Um, They shorted it. They, they made it shorter. So the original barrel length is uh, 28, 7, and they cut it down like... Oh, I didn't write this one down. Maybe another a lot, ten inches yeah. or something. Considerably, it yeah. seems like about a twenty ten or inch. fifteen, maybe. I don't know. I didn't write that one down on what they cut this down to. Hmm. Yeah, it um, seems it's like looking at it. And bolt guns always trip you up a little bit when you compare it to ARs. You know, you look at an mm-hmm. eleven and a half inch AR, and you know, you think it looks like uh, no, it's way different than if you made an eleven and a half inch bolt gun. It would look literally like a pocket gun. But yep. Yeah, it looks like maybe about. But the only thing different about it is you just lost a little velocity. It was a lot lighter mm-hmm. compared to the other one because the other one, so the 9130 that's sitting here is 8.7 pounds. So you cut off a little bit of weight too. You know, 8.7 8. pounds though. I mean, I guess I think to myself, there's a lot of people running around in the woods with hunting rifles that are oh, about. Oh, man. Yeah. Easy. About that. All right, now let's see. Do I pull, to put the bayonet back, do I pull it out? You pull it out. Up? Don't cut nope. yourself. Yeah, oh, don't cut right. yourself. It's sharp. You know what? We'll play with a, that when I'm not we'll wearing a headset. We'll just play with it later. Yeah. The other thing is, since it was a carbine, mm-hmm. they did tinker around with the scout rifle version, mm-hmm. where they would, I believe, get rid of the original iron sights on it and put them out and then put a scope on it. Mm-hmm. But I don't know if it was the PU scope. Or the PE. Like, or the PEE. Yeah. Or P. Yeah. <laughs> so e. I P, P the P one P E E. So I don't know. I didn't get into the Scout version so much of the M forty four. Okay, but I've heard they've they've made them, and they're supposed to be pretty cool. One gr- uh, one 
not on the table and maybe not even real. I'd like somebody who's really savvy with some of these, um, we'll call them cult classic military firearms. The Orbis, the Mosin pistol, not the, not, not the Nagant revolver. Yeah. But you take a Mosin, you zip the stock off, you cut the barrel down, and you get a pistol. So one of those old pirate-like kind of guns? Very much so. So it's a bolt action 762 by 54 r pistol. I've seen a picture mm. of one. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, like, weird. are they real? Are they not? Is this, like, a homemade job? Um, I'd love somebody, if, if anybody's listening, that knows the, the story of that. It, was that a thing? Was that, like, a, was that just something somebody did in their basement? What's the scoop? But Why? I don't know. I That's a great question. I don't even think I'd want that in, like, a trench. I, I just like a stock. Right. 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 I have a fun little Mosin story. Um, I did buy three Mosins uh, when I was a, a firearm safety instructor. Um, we were teaching out of a gun club in my hometown, and we were using wooden dowels and broomsticks as firearms uh, for doing the fence crossing training and that kind of thing. And, and what I noticed, some of the youngsters um, would hold the stick. They would either use them as a lightsaber or they would like not have an appreciation for the you know, severity of the situation if we were in a real, real, real world environment. And so I thought, oh, well, I'll be clever. Uh, so I bought three Mosins and I drilled a hole in the top of the receiver and I, I ran a threaded plug down into them and I cut their firing pins uh, down. So they were completely inoperable. You couldn't load them. You couldn't shoot them. Just a lump. Yeah. And so we're at my buddy's machine shop and we're goofing around and we were, you know, commenting on the bayonet. Um, it's made out of some sort of uh, interesting spring steel. It's very, very uh, strong, like impossibly strong. And it's not terribly sharp. It's quite blunt. Uh, but when you look at it, it, the I guess the use and application is, is implied. You know what that's for. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So somehow we got on the uh, topic of, I think we were watching... Stabbing, for those of you listening. Yeah. yeah. And just- I then think put two and two together. I mm-hmm. think the movie Cold Mountain had come out. If anybody's seen that one with Nicole Kidman, um, and uh, there's a scene on there where the gentleman shoots his his musket dry. He's out of ammo. He has a bayonet affixed to it, and he throws it like a spear. And we thought we'd be clever and and with these now inert and operable firearms, do the same. And uh, embedded into, I believe it was an American ash tree, uh, we ended up with a Mosin. Um, on the other end of its bayonet. Wow. Did he do that? Uh, did Mel Gibson do that in The Patriot? I did he chuck a... Could have. Sounds like a Mel Gibson thing. Um, I don't think so. That's not what they had. No? No, he didn't have a Mosin for Pete's sake. He had a musket, but... <laughs> he did throw some... T- he did a lot of <laughs> tomahawk to action. Nice. <laughs> he threw the tomahawk, but yeah. then he... Uh, the flag at the end, though, he chucks it and it like lands in the ground. It could have. Was it on a musket when he did that? No, I don't think so. Everybody's assignment is watch Patriot. I just um, did okay. a Good couple movie. weeks ago too. Dang. But uh, yeah, so we we um, we were using a, a Mosin um, in a, as a throwing device and stuck it into this tree, and for the life of us, could not get that bayonet out of the tree. Um, so we, of course, had to use a hammer and, and hammer on the other side. Finally, popped it out. Um, but the, the the I guess the whole point of that was a testament to the strength of the bayonet. Um, we couldn't. Bend it, break it, or anything. I mean, it was it was in there. That's it was, impressive. It was wedged. That's a lot of weight on um, the other end of it. You know. Yeah, yeah. So pretty, pretty clever device. Trees you look are at a lot it. tougher than Germans too. Uh, yeah. So uh, was was designed, to, of course, for the purpose in mind. Uh, tool, as we were talking about earlier, it's got a screw G on the end of it. There, so you can take stuff apart. Uh, I think you can use the this part for bolt disassembly too, if I recall correctly. Um, the non-business end. Oh, that'd be pretty, mm-hmm. yeah. pretty smart deal there. Most of the Russian military designs are meant to be field serviceable with, like, with contained within the own device, right? So you have different parts of it. And that wasn't uncommon. Either the Germans employed something of a bolt takedown tool in the stock of the 98 Mauser as well, but uh, had the ability to do things like that with the gun. I mean, it was, it was, it was a war tool, that's for sure. And, and uh, who knows where the nearest armorer was when you were out on the... Uh, Western Front, uh, defending yourself against uh, enemies of the motherland. Uh, pretty clever. Pretty clever. Man, I like these things. Um, how about, so this is the, and remind me what the longer one here is called, the 90... That, so that's the uh, 9130. 9130. So the reason why I got the name 9130, because it was developed in 1891, which was basically what you're seeing here, mm-hmm. but where they got the 30 was when um, they did some changes in 1930. 
okay. that made it the rifle that is actually right there right now. Mm. Um, I can't remember what some of those I changes think, were. I think it was a sight. Was it the sights yeah, that they the changed? Rear sight, and I think there was some handguard and and. Oh, they added these. Yeah, in, in barrel, the thirties, bands around yep. the yep. forend, and then they added this little brass piece here too. Hmm. Um, I, so that's what made it the thirty. That's how it has its name. And was there also a cage on the rear that went around the stripper clip, or oh, am I thinking they, of something else? They, no, you're thinking something else. They they cut down here, okay? Because this used to be. And the other thing is, this used to be square. Okay, so they so the rounded of, it. The top of the receiver here. In so front of the, that was uh, the other thing they changed. Was that uh, it used to be square, so they rounded it so it was easier to machine. Mm, okay, I so, see on on this riddle. one too, and I don't know a lot of numbers on it. Yeah, got a two on the side of this, uh, two up here, three over here. Got a little uh, square insignia with a line through it. Mm-hmm. Got a bunch of numbers engraved on the bolt up there. Any any insight into yes. What does it all mean? Uh, cartouche marks on the stock uh, could indicate a lot of different things, what factories they were out of, what... Uh, you could look at it like a lot number. Okay. Yep. Sure. Um, and uh, so a cartouche is just a marking on the stock as an identifier. It will go. It's rugged. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. It's you Russian can't, made. You can't just yeah. uh, kind of use your little it, fingertips. It, it's from, it's not uh, your Tika where you can just go like that and right, it goes. Right, a little flick of your finger yes. and it goes, right? Fun note on Tika, the Tika factory in Finland produced uh, Mosins. <laughs> Knowing their rifles now, I'd want to find one of those. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so the numbers on the bolt, the bayonet, um, and some other uh, accessories. One on the butt plate. Yep. I mean, so everywhere. That, mm-hmm. was very, that was very common. They would have serialized parts okay. for the guns. And, and like the holy grail of, um, you know, a Mosin would be matching numbers. Right. Um, oh, right. Okay. And, and really, that goes without saying any military firearm. If you were to Safe come across, rifle here. Curious about this trigger. If you were to come Go across a, a little grainy, arm. little grainy. Understandably, got a little weight to it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I never looked up the trigger weight. I'd, I'd probably say maybe four pounds, if that's your long, guess. Long, long. And it's a it long. Is. It's a very long pull. It yeah. is. Yeah, you're yeah. going. It's a very going, long pull. Going. And, there it is. And there's, it's hard to find the wall on those. It is kind of. There's no, it's, it's very, kind of mushy all it's the way mushy. back. So you're just sort yeah. of like, oh, there, it, it happened. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, your uh, rear sight here. Wow. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, does this rear sight go out to 2,000 meters? It wasn't <sighs> meters. Yeah. It's, a, it's a Russian unit of measurement that mm-hmm. I can't recall. Of course, what they it have is. their own. Yeah. Why but wouldn't they have their own? It's not meters. And it I goes just, out to 20. I should have studied up on that. This is inc- but judging by how much it's cantilevering up this rear sight, I wouldn't doubt it if it's somewhere near two thousand meters. I think it's f- it's probably further. I mean, it's I mean, see, this is this is seriously looks like something you'd see on a grenade launcher. Yeah, I don't. Mm-hmm. I'm not even halfway yet. I don't recall the I don't recall the number. If if my buddy Alex is listening <laughs> to this podcast, uh, Alex, um, in Russian, <laughs> please describe to us what this unit of measurement is. That's um, an artillery piece when you have it all the way up it, that way. It literally is, Lobbing yeah. Lobbing that thing in. Yeah, yeah, at the uh, at the Germans in the, in the next country over. Mm-hmm. Wow. One thing about those, in, in the hands of a skilled marksman, even with the regular infantry rifle that you have in your hands there, Jimmy, mm-hmm. effective range with the iron sights was 500 meters. Oh, I think, which is pretty pretty good, considering the time. I think that perhaps the Russians were the most um, realistic with that kind of thing, because you know, like you look at, at a 1903 Springfield, like you have, or a mm-hmm. 1917, or a 98 Mauser, and um, they touted that max effective range at a you yeah. know a, in or near a thousand yards. And right. Let's be honest. I think uh, I think uh, the Russians had a, a, a better handle on what was doable and what was not mm-hmm. um yeah mark mm. are you looking up that unit of measurement so let me see if, tell me if this corroborates kind of with what you're seeing and i don't know which one you're looking at there it says here the original rear sights on russian m91 rifles are a flat leaf graduated in arshini yeah. singular arshin which is an archaic russian unit equal to 28 inches the base has five notches numbered four, six, eight, ten. 
This one goes to 20. This is a 9130, mind you. Oh, and 12, representing hundreds of Arshini. So we got a lot of Arshini on this a lot one? Of, a whole lot of Arsh- Arshin. Lot of, is how, that's interesting. Quite a few Arshinis. The, we are now... Fact check it. Mm-hmm. No, that sounds right, because I couldn't remember what the name of, of the unit of measurement is, but we now refer to everything in uh, Arshin. <laughs> that sounds... I'm, yeah. I'm down. Um, explain the uh, Explain this bolt. Uh, because it goes straight up. You know, it's like this 90-degree bolt mm-hmm. kind of throw, which is a little bit goofy. Um, is there... I don't know of any other firearms today that are doing this kind of kind of deal here. No, no longer. It honestly doesn't feel crazy, like a crazy long bolt throw, though. It's not. It's it's pretty... It's, it's actually... Pretty, yeah, it's a 90-degree bolt. Yeah, I can, it's a 90-degree bolt. I can uh, tell you for one reason why it's that way. Okay. Because... Sometimes, because like I said, they weren't built, you know, like your AR-15 with tight tolerances. Sure. They're more built like the AK-47. Sometimes you need a hammer to drive the bolt home just to close it because it gets hot. And everything expands, and you can't load a round. Or you can't eject the last spent round. So you just get an easy hammer right on that bolt knob. That's why you got it perfectly 90 degrees, and you take the... Back claw of the hammer, and I've had to do it with that one because I've had it out shot it a couple times, bolt warmed up. I'd get it up here, start to pull back, it wouldn't budge. And I'd sit there and just try to muscle it, like, all right, well, I got to do it the Russian way. Go get the hammer. <laughs> it's and historical. If, and if it didn't work, Grandpa always said, get a bigger hammer. That's right. And it was historical because words of wisdom. That's how it would happen. BFH is the most important hammer you can have in your toolbox. Exactly. No external safety on the Mosin Um The safety was the cocking mechanism yep. on the back, and that's why it's got the knurling. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, wait, what? So, yeah. It's, so go ahead and it's pretty so clever. You, Show you chamber mm-hmm. around yep. and yeah. then cock back the... Uh, Pull okay. that back. And it's they made it very stiff. Yeah, I, I, it's, I got my creamy, lotiony hands. Yeah. yeah. There. What, we got it. What do you have? It's safe. And she's, it's on safe now. I feel like I feel like you just sprung it back, and you just now it's just in waiting to just accidentally get bumped and then just fly. Back I mean, and you hit the yeah back of them. could. It won't hit anything because there's a sear mechanism in there, but that is oh, that. okay. Yep. So right there, that is the uh, safe mode. So it's locked out. You can't fire it. It won't go bang. That is the firing pin lock mode. Effectively, the safety. Note the knurling on the ladder model. Sure. Uh, no knurling on this one. Kind of hurts the the desk fingers. That's the desk model, so that's what I would use because I'm a desk person. Um, wow. <laughs> so you get the short one. Correct. So you get the right. short one. Yeah. It's quite all right, right? But uh, that's what that's all about. So, yeah, no external safety. Um, I don't see myself as uh, somebody on the Western Front fiddling with that much. I think Because I don't ever want to have to be like, yeah, they're blitzkrieging, and then... You know, I don't know if it was like there. A, I don't know if it <laughs> was like a what. transport thing, so you have it that way, like your bolt can't come open. Yeah, so sure, you, you that, can't I can get, see that. Yep. Um, and then, I, I mean, it's not its not a heck of a lot of work to get it over. It's just a slight pull and a slide, yeah. and it's ready to go. Uh, I need to have some historian tell me what the condition was that you carried these in. I, I imagine it was probably carried in that more than it was not, hmm. um, at least during, you know, not combat moment. Right. Um, I think, when, so you asked about the bolt design, and you're like, well, it's kind of goofy and, and different than anything that you've seen before. A rifle to look up, there's a few... Uh, Dutch rifles um, that had a similar bolt mechanism. These are very, very early bolt-action repeaters, um, and they had a vertical or a full 90-degree bolt like this. They had a kind of an unconventional cocking piece in the rear. They were magazine-fed, um, large bore diameter in the 11-millimeter range. Um, and I think, uh, if I've got this right, some of those design cues were borrowed uh, during the development of, of the Mosin. Hmm. Um and then that's kind of where that stopped. Everything the old else. classic borrow. Yeah, um, and that yeah, I mean that's that's the Mosin bolt in a nutshell. It's extremely utilitarian. There's very few moving parts for a, a bolt action rifle. Actually, it has a pretty modern extractor from from that standpoint. I mean, Peter Paul Mauser was uh, the bolt action firearm god at that time, uh, and had a pretty different bolt design. If you were to look at, say, a Nosler M48 or a Howa 1500 or, or some of the more um, 
uh, you know, in the fashion, modern bolt guns, they have a very similar extractor or extractor mechanism. The ejector is just part of, you know, the receiver here. You can see it's a, a sprung leaf design. Uh, nothing has changed in terms of bolt action uh, technology since this had come out. Hmm. Um, so really, you know, I guess you could call it a uh, front runner uh, for its time, especially. How about that? Yeah. How about uh, my favorite one on the table here? The Heels, sniper? The sniper. So how they were developed. So when they were being produced, and they produced lots, you know, and okay. then yep. they'd had old Ivan sitting at the end of the line, and literally what he would do, he would take a lot, go out to the range, and shoot them. And they would, be, they would do a four-round group. If that group was 30 millimeters or 1.18 inches group, that became a sniper. Beast so that one. got, <laughs> yeah. So I even had a, a sore shoulder every day. Yeah. And he literally would, you know, shoot it. Oh, sniper. Shoot this one. Nope. Regular infantry. <laughs> infantry. You know, I feel bad for his shoulder at the end of the day of doing that job because yeah. those things kick like a mule. So then they would send it back into the shop and they would refit them or repurpose them. Mm -hmm. So what they would do, it's on your other side there, Jimmy. They the, si would, the opposite side of the bolt? The opposite side, yeah. If okay. you want to show the camera there. Right. They would cut the stock out to place sure that enough. scope mount in there. And then you would that big bolt there, you would put that into that knuckle piece, and then you would tighten that down. And then there was two screws inside on the other side in the bolt area. Oh, yeah, when you opened up the receiver, maybe yeah. the camera will catch this. You can see these two screws coming in here to the receiver. Mm -hmm. And that's how they mounted it. Now, you could do uh, windage on uh, the actual mount itself hmm. without turning the knobs with shims. And then the other thing is it just comes with, so once you get that zeroed, it has the adjustments like any other scope would actually have. They were marked out, you know, in distance and windage. And what you could get out of this, that's actually a PU scope. They made uh, 220,000 of them. Wow, okay. That's and they're a 3.5 times 22 millimeter. Um. The eye relief, I, what was the number on the eye relief? It's close. <laughs> it's, it, it's tough. Get okay. in there. It's old school. And if you look down it, down the scope, you have two lines that go like this. Okay? Mm -hmm. By and everybody then for a second here. One, one line that comes up like this where they all meet, and that has the point on it. Right. So uh, if you've ever seen the movie Enemy of the Gates, mm -hmm. I believe they show that you them looking down the scope. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, you know, what this rifle is based off of is Enemy of the Gates. Great movie, by the way. I could rewatch it over and over and over. I plan on watching that one tonight, as a matter of fact. No, no joke. It's not a bad idea. No. Am I coming know. over to watch it? You're welcome to. <laughs> I would love to. Um, so, yeah, they they also did make a PEM scope that Ryan mentioned earlier. Those were less common little bit bigger. It kind of looked more like your modern day mm -hmm. scope. Um, and they had a little more um, magnific magnification. Oh boy, I'm having a hard time speaking today. Slip yeah. up on it all the time here. Um, <laughs> Safe. And it was a lot better. Um, but they didn't make as many of them. Is that one of those ones with the uh, rubber sticky outy thing on the yeah. eyepiece end that you're supposed to put your face like up Like you to? see in the Dragonoff. Das Boot. Mm -hmm. I like those. Yeah. They are cool. There's something about you it. Wanna, that just looks you want to trick your buddy? You get a little shoe polish and you put it on the boot, <laughs> <laughs> and then he shoulders it. There you go. He's got, got the black yep. eye. Yeah. Yep. Oh, and by the way, if that their testing was at 100 meters. By the way, okay. that's how they. Had how many? How many? Uh, how do we say it? Ash, Ash, Arshini? Arshini. Arshini. How many Arshini is that? Which is probably uh, not how you say. Oh, this it one has. No. Uh, this one has. 20 Arshini on the uh, iron sight, which it still retains. It as still well. has it still has the original iron sights. As you can just peek this right under the scope too. Mm -hmm. Yep, and that's what's really nice about that is if that fails, you damage it. You know, it gets dropped or whatever, the gun is still going to shoot. 
You yeah. just go to your backup irons. It's kind of like running a scope and then having side 45 backup irons where you can go yeah. and then turn. Or The original peak unders. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Fun fact, many Russian snipers didn't actually use the scope. That's true. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of... Uh, I think Enemy at the Gates made it very sensationalized. But yes. most of those shooters were like just regular Joes and Janes in the front line, and there was no chance that they were going to get one of these things. Mm-hmm. Um, so they would just have these. And, and that's not to take away from their effectiveness as snipers because they were probably heralded as some of the uh, you know most effective snipers of wartime history. Uh, but the, the telescopic weapon sight was rare. Um, in in the combat theater, I, I mean, I guess when you look at the number of shooters that were shooting them, um, so he's got knobs on it. Yeah, yeah. That is that supposed to do? Right, mm-hmm. right. Yeah. I think it was at that point in time. It was just a matter of allocation of resources. Um, yeah. So some of the more famous uh, Russian and Finnish snipers that utilized this weapon didn't um, didn't actually get the chance to use the scope. Interesting. Yeah. How were they? They were just single feeding it. Then you're not going to get a stripper, stripper clip in there. Right. With you scope had to, on it. Yep. You can. That's, yeah. You can single load the mag. You had to single right. load yeah. it. Right. Yeah. yeah they're Took not a little get bit stri- longer. Stripper but, clip in there. And then you know they had to modify the bolt because it, you know the old the old one comes up at 90 degrees. You're going to be hitting that. So right. The bolt handle. This actually helps yeah. you get a little leverage on it too. I feel like you mm-hmm. can rack the bolt a little bit quicker with something like this. I uh, got some figures on um, kills for the rifle. They. Russians claim that there was 4,200 confirmed kills with that rifle in World War II. Um, the other thing is some of it was uh, skewed just for propaganda. Sure. And they also did say, though, that Russia had the most amount of snipers per capita against Germany. So it was like ten to one or something like that. It's some some kind of really outlandish yeah. number where the Russian had more snipers, more kills because there was more snipers. You wonder if they did well, whether or not they did or not. I guess we may never know. But mm-hmm. like, if you were going to strike some fear into the heart of uh, a much better financed and well organized enemy force, mm-hmm. well, I. Oh, we've got snipers all over the hills. Yeah. There, I mean, literally. How many do you have? You have a hundred? Mm-hmm. Oh, we have a thousand. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Terrifying. Uh, yeah. Sniper on every corner. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I tell you what would be a uh, heck of a podcast would be to get a uh, World War II sniper, sniper from Vietnam era, and then a modern day sniper to just compare oh and gosh. contrast. I can't tell, you know, because you got, and I, I'm leaving out some conflicts in there, but those are kind of the big three that pop into mm-hmm. my head. Well, we had Tony. We had Tony on. It was yeah. it made yeah. for an interesting one, but you know, uh, the the what it would have been like for a sniper back in World War Two, and then you know, in the stories you hear about the Vietnam uh, sniping kind of uh, things that went on, um, they all had their own unique uh, different styles, different yeah. styles. They had mm-hmm. different tools to work with. You know, mm-hmm. um, amazing stories and well, whatnot. see, my dad was up against that in Vietnam. Yeah. One of the most yep. famous female Vietnamese snipers yep. that John Hathcock had to fight. Did I say his name right? Carlos Hathcock. Carlos, yep. I am so sorry. Um, he carried yep. the Mazen sniper rifle. Yep. Yeah. And I watched the, the show where he tells a story about fighting her or having a duel with her, a sniper duel. Pretty good. It's old. You know, it's not in 4K because... Mr. Halfcock didn't live very long, but the huh. interview is amazing. It sounds real, like it. The other thing, another caveat is this rifle right here has been in over 40 wars. Isn't that crazy? It's very crazy. Yeah. And it's been the long, longest lasting rifle in wars. It's the only one that has seen 40 wars compared to any other rifle ever made for wartime use. Hmm. How about that? Because the Lee en- the Lee Enfield is up there, right? Mm-hmm. It's up there, yeah. but it's up there. I'm not, not going to say it's. Yeah, it's touching. not going to compare. To, it's not going to touch the numbers that the yeah. Mosin has. Yeah, it, I went over the list, and I'm like, I'm not going to list all 40 wars it's been in. Yeah, the tricky part. I don't have that kind yeah. of time, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the tricky part with like the Lee Enfield is that 
it was a standard British service weapon for a lot longer than you might have anticipated. Like while the rest of the world modernized in terms of arms. Well, even the Canadian Mounties only just stopped carrying. Them. Right. Like, Two years ago or not something? Long, not Three? that long ago. Yeah, and I mean, you look at uh, some of Britain's former and, I guess, still colonies. Um, they're, they're still there. Um, so it's kind of an interesting thing. Um, British people just like to keep stuff old for a real long time. Yeah. You know, they are kind of an old time around, well. They just kind of like, oh, it's been this way for a couple hundred years. Why, Why change? change? Mm-hmm. <laughs> if, it, if it works, don't fix it. Yeah, yeah. I guess so. These are really, really cool guns, Will. Yeah. Um, awesome. Like, glad you brought these in. I'm, gl- I'm glad we talked about Mosins because and, and the cartridge as well, but I'm glad that we talked about these because it, it seemed as though it wasn't overnight because I sort of watched it happen a little bit. You know, right. It was like, well, you know, now they're 120 bucks and now mm-hmm. they're out of stock. They came back, now it's 200 And you kind of saw them crept up there a little bit but or creep up, but... At the same time, though, is like I do feel like I blinked, and I then I kind of I didn't miss the opportunity. You can still go out and get one, right? Blink, and they're all grown up, Jim. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's right. It's like a young toddler just all of a sudden turning into a teenager on you. They probably don't get the credit that they're due. They do, and do you think that has to do with the the uh, reputation they got as just being this cheap Russian gun? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Oh, you want you want one? Why not get ten? I don't. Um, I don't know why that uh, that is the case, uh, because they are actually quite wonderful. They 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 shoot exceptionally well. I mean, it's rare to find one that's a real dog on the target range. Um, the ammunition is plentiful. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and it is a piece of very important history. I mean, these folks uh, were our allies through World War II, and without them, there was probably a possibly different outcome. Um, and mm-hmm. this was one of the many devices used to help uh, turn those tides. Um, so yeah, it, you know, probably should uh, if you're thinking about adding something to your collection that is significant, don't turn your nose up at the Mosin. That's right. Do you uh, think you remember what was the um, seven four something by thirty? The other the AK seventy four round. What is that again? Five four five by thirty nine. Yeah. So I remember everybody freaked out about that because like ammunition went away because of Russian politics or something like that, and you couldn't import it anymore. That's not Is that not a thing with the 7.62 by 5.4R? Uh, I mean, with respect to Russian-produced ammo, but there's also other companies or other countries that produce okay. good ammo. All right. Um, so part of, part of that was, like, you couldn't get the good stuff, if you will. Mm. Um, there's a lot of other ammunition companies out there that aren't in Russia that make very good Bear. ammo. Yeah. Bears one, and, and uh, I mean, Got it. former Yugoslavia, Serbia. Um, I think there's some stuff in the Netherlands, um, and there's some stuff that come out of Asia that's also pretty darn good as well. So, yeah, Neat. yeah, you can go online and find ammo for it anywhere, and it's actually pretty reasonable with the times that we're in right now. It's reasonable, and it's still available because I even bought some to bring to the show. Oh, well. well I we should it, do a I test. I left it in the car. <laughs> we should do a test. We'll check the day before this podcast releases, and then we'll check a week after and see if it's still available slash cheap. Uh, no, yeah. Oh, yeah. Exactly. So you, see what kind of mm-hmm. push yeah. we had there? Yeah. 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 Now we just told everybody that yeah. during uh, whatever's going on. yeah. There's you want to really gun. goof up the, uh, the balance. I'm going to tell you a cartridge you can get a hold of anytime. Um, it's worth buying in bulk. 300 Winchester sc- short mag. Uh, <laughs> 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 That's true. I thought you were going to screw up the one I'm just about to get. What don't are you, do that. What are you about to get, Jim? Don't don't say. There's ammo for it everywhere. Oh, I know what it is. I can What's your guess? I'm not going to say it. I'm it's not, not a 300 gym. wisdom. Yeah, it's close. And sorry, they don't make that in a 300 wisdom. You can't get a well, 300 wisdom Mosin. They'll come around uh, unless you know unless you know a gunsmith. Mm-hmm. Might have to find Mark's one. just the kind of we were just I at know, a gun. He's not that kind of guy. Mark wouldn't do it. Somebody out there has probably got a 300 wisdom Mosin. <laughs> It wouldn't go past me, yeah. honestly. Well, with some of the things that you can do with these, though, um, like DTM, you can buy a chassis for these. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah. There's, oh, yeah. I've There's been looking people... into it where people buy chassis. The only unfortunate thing that happens when you buy the chassis for those is you can't go back to stock because oh. you literally have to, if you can't, you have to cut these off or stretch mm. them. Yeah. And I can't 
force yourself to, to destroy the rifle. Yeah, destroy the rifle. Destroy a piece of history. In, in my humble opinion, I can't do it. Like sporterizing some of these, I never yeah. sporterize one because it's I'm destroying history in, in my eyes. The That's old, my own opinion, of course. Yeah, the old pimp my Mosin. But I know there are <laughs> there were a lot of people doing a lot <laughs> of stuff. Wasn't with that them. a TV show, Jim? Yeah, yeah. I think it yeah, had uh, Scoop Dog on it. Ludicrous. Uh, anyway, but. Um, yeah, I remember seeing people doing stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And um, what do you do about the trigger, though, in that case? They make aftermarket triggers? They actually triggers? make aftermarket triggers for these. <sighs> yeah, because the trigger it's is mushy in on the these. Bag. You, you yep. can get a bullpup Mosin. What? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, you want to go down? You want to go do some weird stuff? You can buy a bullpup kit for your Mosin. That's, that's, a, that's, that's a, a nice that's rabbit the hole. The next podcast, down. get weird with your Mosin. Let's get weird. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Well, uh, for those of you, again, out there listening, let us know what you think about Mosins. If you, uh, any of you out there have a Mosin, you want to talk about it, let us know in comments uh, on Instagram or on YouTube. And uh, even shout out some comments about what you think about these ones, because I think, Will, you got a nice little, uh, nice little posse of Mosins here. Thank you. Yeah. These are Appreciate good. Appreciate it. These are good for sure. Also, the cartridge, too. Um, so, uh, yeah, what... what what wild game are people taking with the old 76254R out oh, there? Oh, yeah. Tis the mm-hmm. season, We'd isn't it? Yeah, it's getting That's close. Right. Yeah. That's right. It's just around the corner. So, uh, yeah. With that said, thanks, everybody, for listening. Will, huge yeah. thanks for yeah, joining thanks us. For hey, out, thank you for having me. This has been my pleasure to help you guys out with anything. Oh, so yeah, it's I, absolutely I love our, it. our pleasure. We'll reach out in the, uh, in the IG on Instagram and in our uh, direct messages there at Vortex Nation Podcast and said, hey, let's talk about this. So, here we are. Uh, so yeah, if anybody else out there has really something super interesting they want to hear, we're always all ears. Cool. Awesome. All right. Well, with that said, everybody, we'll catch you next time. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Will. Bye. Thank you. All right. That'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation Podcast. Again, everybody, thanks and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.